Good morning and welcome to another edition of Hawaii Matters. I'm Michael T. in for Diane Ako. Here in Hawaii, it's obvious we're surrounded by the Pacific Ocean and one of the activities that many people engage in is fishing. Joining us today are two guests from the Western Pacific Regional Fishery Management Council. They're here to talk about fishing in Hawaii and specifically the Fisherman Code of Conduct. Joining us are Sylvia Spaulding, uh, she's the Media and Education Specialist for the Council, and Charles Ka'ai'ai, the Indigenous Program Coordinator for the Fishery Council. Welcome, both of you. Oh, thank you, thank you, good morning. Uh, Charles, we'll start with you. What is the Western Pacific Regional Fishery Management Council? That's a long name. Yeah, well, the Western Pacific Regional Fishery Management Council is one of eight regional fishery management councils established by Congress, uh, the Magnuson-Stevens Fishery Conservation and Management Act in 1976. The Western Pacific Council has authority over the fisheries in the Pacific Ocean, seaward of state and territorial waters around Hawaii, American Samoa, Guam, and the Northern Mariana Islands. Uh, during the first 35 years, the Council's accomplishments have run the gamut from being the first regional fishery management council in the nation to prohibit drift gill net fishing and develop an ecosystem-based fishery management plan, and being the pioneer of vessel monitoring system for fishing ve vessels, which is now being implemented in fisheries worldwide. The Council is made up of 16 Council members, the Council staff, and hundreds of people in the Council's numerous advisory bodies. So. Uh, we have a lot of people in our council family. The mm. council process is a bottom-up process, so we depend on our advisors to let us know what's happening in the fisheries, what's happening in their communities with regard to fisheries, and and try to stay on top of the situations that are developing. And the council's mission is to promote sustainable fishing. So we're all for fishing for our communities. That's good. So Charles, when you say the council has authority over the fisheries, what what kind of authority uh, is that? What's the magnitude of the authority? And then who who comes under that authority? Is it like the average Joe fisherman? Or is it the industry, the fishing industry? Or is it everybody in between? Uh, well, you're talking about the federal ju uh, f jurisdiction. And the federal jurisdiction, the council has authority over fisheries from the territorial and state waters seaward. So we're talking about the federal fisheries. These are the longline fisheries. We have some crustacean fisheries. We have other fisheries that we manage. So we create the rules and regulations that govern those fisheries and try to make those rules that will be sustainable and will keep people in the fisheries, keep people fishing. Um, what, when you say seaward, what, do, what does that mean? Seaward, it means, it means away from the shore. Like we, for, uh, for example, Hawaii. There's a three-mile state waters, which state has jurisdiction over. Mm -hmm. And then from three to 200 is the U.S. economic zone. Yeah. And then the federal fishers go from three miles to seaward, to beyond, even beyond the 200-mile zone. Got it. So inside of that three-mile, it's all state. State jurisdiction, okay. right. And you guys are concerned with outside of that. Right. Just so we know who we're talking about and, you know, if the average person listening right now is like, does this apply to me? It, it, it might not apply, but it's important for right. people to know. Right. Right? Um, it's important for people to know because, you know, when they get their sashimi and uh, their local bottom fish, it's from these fisheries. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so let's talk about the council a little bit. How does one become a fishery council member? Okay, for the state of Hawaii and for the territories, um, people are, are recommended. Um, they ask for about three people for every position. They're recommended by the governor of the state or territory. Mm -hmm. And that goes before the Secretary of Commerce. And the Secretary of Commerce makes a decision on who should sit on the, on the uh, council. And the whole idea is to have a balance on the council of industry people, uh, government people, uh, the regular um, uh, non-commercial fisheries, uh, recreational people, to have a nice mix on the council so that a good, appropriate decisions can be made on creating rules and regulations. Hmm. So w when the council makes decisions, like how many people are affected? Like in the in the in fishing industry, how many people are in, in for this? Western region, how many people are you guys talking about? Your jurisdiction extends out to how many people? 
Well, a lot of a lot of the decisions the council makes will will impact almost everyone in the state, everyone in that co- community. Um, what we're really talking about, if we're talking about the long liners, are about 170 long line permits that are available that mm. that are being that have been permitted. People that can fish, 170 fishers. We make a regulation that affect them, but they bring in the fish that hit our market, and the fish, the quality, the amount that hit our market determines the prices that all of us pay for those fishes. Mm, mm-hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, so we know a little bit about the council, uh, it, and uh, we're we're touching on the whole fishing industry. What are the big issues that are facing the industry uh, relative to the uh, Western Region Fishing Council? There's, there's a number of issues. Uh, all of them are kind of timely. Um, you know, for our long-line fisheries, they're really managed internationally. In other words, they're managed by agreements we make with international organizations, uh, other people that use the high seas for fishing. Um, uh, some of the other issues that we face, with, uh, that we face are uh, interactions with protected species, endangered species, um, uh, sea turtles, whales, uh, migratory birds. Um, there are there are also market forces at work on the fisheries. So there's a whole bunch of issues that the council will have to deal with in making decisions on rules and regulations, on um, conduct of fishing, uh, and looking at what kind of research we need to support the decisions that we've made. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so on the long line fishery, as uh, Charlie said, uh, besides being managed by the council as far as how many permits, you know, boat size, uh, uh, regulations like that, where we come up with a fishery ecosystem plan and they have management measures in there and then they're forwarded to the Secretary of Commerce, which uh, approves them. But uh, beyond that, as uh, Charlie was saying, the United States is a member of certain treaties in, in the Western and Central Pacific Ocean and also in the Eastern Pacific Ocean. And that's because tuna and other, like billfish, are highly migratory. And so just to have one nation regulate it, you know, uh, won't really uh, take care of the stock. And so one of the issues we have right now is for the big eye tuna. Uh, which is where our sashimi comes from. Mm -hmm. Uh, Well, there's also Persane fishery that catches skipjack tuna, which is the smaller tuna for the canned tuna industry. Mm -hmm. But uh, in the last couple of decades, they started setting fish aggregation devices that have caught not only the skipjack, but juvenile big eye and yellowfin tuna. So there is an issue of overfishing a big eye right now. Mm. And because of that, they've set international quotas by nations for the longline fishery, and then uh, vessel days around fads for the Persane fishery. So uh, because of that, our Hawaii longline fishery for big eye tuna is uh, being restricted in fishing for big eye from now until the rest of the year because mm. of the quota. Yeah. How does that impact the average person? Uh, one, for local uh, big eye, there probably will be less of it and maybe prices will rise mm-hmm. and also then what you do is you get imports in and for like sashimi they're usually uh, carbon monoxide to keep the color in them mm. and then they're frozen and, and uh, so there's more of a risk depending on how they're handled in these foreign countries of getting salmonella and other uh, uh, you know health issues uh, introduced so also it's just a matter of preference to do you want fresh fish because all of the tuna landed in Hawaii is fresh just iced or frozen two things strike me uh, while you were answering the the breadth of subject matter it seems really wide for the council and uh, it, the things that you do and you come in contact with decisions that you guys make uh, really do affect people listening to this program Right, it, um, it does, yeah. Because, you know, if we begin to import, if we have to close the fishery and we begin to import uh, fish from elsewhere, that undercuts our fishing industry because now they have another source and will our fishing industry be able to fill that uh, in another year in a, or in another season? Yeah, and then by industry too, it's not just the fishermen, right? Yeah. It's tackle shops, ice shops, you know. 
the retailers, mm, wholesalers. There's a whole yeah, domino there's a, effect yeah. of, yeah. of uh, activity. Uh, you're listening to Hawaii Matters. It's Michael T. in for Diana Ko this morning. We're talking to Sylvia Spaulding, the media and education specialist for the Western Pacific Regional Fishery Management Council, and Charles Ka'ai'ai, the Indigenous Program Coordinator for the Fishery Council. Uh, specifically, you guys are here to talk about the code of conduct that uh, governs I don't know if that's the, the right word, uh, the uh, fishing industry. Can you tell us, uh, Charles, what is the code of conduct? Well, a code of conduct is a non-regulatory set of rules that supports the regulatory regime. A community code of conduct is a code of conduct that a community develops to guide their behavior towards certain resources. For communities, it can be very specific or it can be very general, but supports the regulatory regime. And so... What, what that is is kind of like an unwritten law, right? You have an unwritten law that supports the way um, the fishery is managed or the way people behave. And so that the importance of that community code of conduct is that it encourages voluntary compliance. The community conduct is developed in the community and they vet it through their community and co compliance with the codes will be good. Right? Because everybody's agreed that this is a good set of rules that we can follow mm -hmm. that will support this regulatory regime. And the community enforces that code through community and peer pressure. But it's another tool that we use in managing the fishery and natural resources. Um, for the in industry code of conduct, they have to develop their own. We have a kind of a generic code of conduct to deal with fisheries. We feel that everybody should should be using this code of conduct to say, within the regulations that we asked it to, to be kind of, you know, when we did the, uh, when we had a conference and, and one of the kupuna said, oh, that's just common sense, it's just what we do. I mean, that's kind of a code of conduct, right? Mm -hmm. It's that code of conduct for that community. Mm. So um, having a code of conduct just supports the regulatory regime. I think it makes the fisheries better. So the challenge, as I hear it, would be communicating that code of conduct how 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 does the communication of those of the code of conduct happen well for us it would be education and outreach uh, in the community it would be the community passing it on by word of mouth or ha creating a kind of a, a regime where people are automatically doing this you know we don't normally do this here we don't do that kind of stuff here mm. that kind of stuff right um, but for uh, this kind of general code of conduct we really want to get out there with education and outreach and have everyone agree to it, uh, buy into it, see that it makes a lot of sense, mm -hmm. and um, in that way create a, a regular system of good behavior mm -hmm. in fisheries and in, and in natural resources. Yeah. So I guess that begs the question, is there resistance at all at any time to, so like when you say, this is the way we do that, to, uh, what if somebody says, well, I'd rather do it not that way? Right. Right, there's always that. There's always that that um, issue that's going to arise, right, that I don't agree with your code of conduct. And that's that's why it's important that when you develop a code of conduct, you develop it with the community that you want that code of conduct to, mm -hmm. to exist in. Mm -hmm. You know, and then you have this voluntary compliance. And again, like laws and like regulations, you're not going to have 100% compliance. Mm -hmm. But if you can get voluntary compliance, that makes enforcing regulations so much easier. Mm. So I guess you're saying it works, peer pressure works in this situation. Yes, oh and yes. Would you say that the uh, compliance, uh, if you had to grade compliance in the fisher, fishing industry, uh, could you give it a number? Like uh, we have 100% compliance, we have 50%, what, what would be the number? I don't know what a number would be, but I, I would say that we have a really good compliance in our fishery in Hawaii That's good. with the regulations. I mean, really, really good compliance. and and. Um, yeah, there may be complaints, and they show up at the council meeting, right, mm -hmm. <laughs> to register their complaints. But once it's decided, our industry is professional enough that they will comply. Mm. The Fisherman Code of Conduct that we're going to be talking about a lot today is uh, one that's more for the uh, nearshore fisheries or, you know, um, fisheries that uh, community members use. There is another code of conduct uh, by the United Nations uh, Food and Agriculture Organization. It's a code of conduct for responsible fisheries. And for our longline fishery, it's been uh, assessed by a third party, and they're uh, like 90 to 95% compliant 
uh, which is the highest compliance in the in the world. Wow, that's that, that's that's a high batting average. Yeah, that's good. Uh, Charles, tell us about the uh, code of, going back to the the local code of conduct. Uh, it's part of a larger system. Can you tell us about that? A, a locally based system. Yeah. Well, code of conduct was. Uh, when we did a Puvalu series of conferences and talked to native native Hawaiians in Hawaii, and they came up with this idea of ahamoku management, one of the things that we had to do when we worked with the community with was finding out what this traditional resource management system looks like. And there were actually five pillars that the code of conduct was part of. Um, and the the uh, the Ahakiole advisory committee advisory committee with reported back to the legislature on these five pillars, these five pillars of traditional resource management. Um, that, that committee was temporary, and a later legislative act created the Ahamoku advise, uh, Advisory Committee within DLNR. And the Ahamoku promotes traditional values for all of Hawaii residents and visitors alike. So the Code of Conduct was part of that package. Uh, there were um, there were five pillars in that package. Mm -hmm. So we're, uh, we are talking about um, something that is attentive to the traditions of Hawaii and how we've done things over the uh, I don't know, maybe decades, maybe centuries. Mm, decades. Yeah, decades. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so tell us a little bit more about the the five pillars uh, of the Ahamoku. Okay. Well, the legislature had uh, tasked the Ahakiole Advisory Committee with coming up with the system of best practices for traditional management. Uh, the idea was that Hawaiians lived here for over a thousand years and they were able to manage their resources. So they must have had a way to manage their resource. Mm -hmm. So when the Ahakiole Advisory Committee went out to the community, what they found out that was that there were five pillars to this traditional management. And that was an adaptive management system. So it's a regulatory system where you create regulations that respond to the environmental and um, other impacts that you have, right? So if there's a, if say, moi is down, right? You go in the water and you see there's not much moi. Mm -hmm. You put kapu on moi so that the moi can come back, mm -hmm. right? Okay. So, so you have this adaptive system of, of creating regulations. And, and then when they do come back, you have a, you have a way to say, okay, now, now moi is okay. Everybody can fish for that. Well, and then something else may, may be in low abundance, yeah, mm -hmm. a holy holy something. Then you create a couple for that. So it's this kind of adaptive, always monitoring the ecosystem and always developing regulations that support that ecosystem. The second pillar was the code of conduct. And it was a way that people would learn to habitually behave in that system, right? Mm -hmm. So that um, the bad behavior was not allowed in that system. Mm. So that was the code of conduct. This is the way we do things. This is how we harvest this. This is how we, uh, this is the net we use for this. This is the kind of hook we use for this. Um, then the third one was community consultations because apparently in the old days, uh, the Konohiki had to consult with his community, had to find out what, what was important to the community, what the community valued, um, how they wanted the resource to be managed. You know, if uh, somebody is hungry for manini today, is the manini good, a good thing to catch today? You go and get the advice of the Konohiki. Uh, education, and that education was so that everybody knew what was happening, how the regulations were made, what the codes of conduct were, um, what the state of the, the resource was. And then the last thing they came up with was eligi eligibility criteria to participate in the management process. And they said, well, if you want to participate in the management process and make recommendations and, and try and push rules and stuff, then you need to know something about the resource. Mm -hmm. So the best guy, I guess, I guess the best example you can think of that is that, you know, if you want to make rules about Akule, you could, you could talk to the Akule guy, mm -hmm. right? And he would know how the Okule is and what rules should be put in place. Mm. So that was the five pillars, the adaptive management, the code of conduct, community consultation, education, and elig eligibility criteria to participate in the process. It sounds like a lot of common sense uh, applied to yeah. the, 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 uh, the whole fishing industry. 
you're listening to Hawaii Matters. It's Michael T in for Diana Ko this morning. We're talking to Sylvia Spaulding, the media and education specialist for the Western Pacific Regional Fishery Management Council, and Charles Kaii, the Indigenous Program Coordinator for the Fishery Council. Sylvia, what what are the codes? Tell us about the the the, uh, the codes in this code of conduct. Okay, so the <clears throat> there's nine of them. One is respect nature and your place in it. Two, seek advice of experts with generational knowledge of the local resources. Three, show regard to spawning seasons and juvenile fish. Four, do not waste, take only what is needed. Five, keep safe people, property, and resources. Six, obey fishing laws and rules. Seven, use proper gear and techniques. Eight, pick up your trash. And nine, share your catch. Again, very basic, very commonsensical. Right. And right. I, I, I like that about that. So how was the code developed? Well, uh, Charlie alluded to uh, uh, some conferences that we held where we brought in Native Hawaiian practitioners from all of the islands. That was in 2006 and 2007. And... Uh, then we, uh, and they had mentioned, you know, the Code of Conduct came out uh, with the Aha Kioli report. So we went back and looked at uh, the minutes, you know, or not the minutes, but just the records of that, uh, of that, those conferences, and uh, looked at some of the advice that the, uh, the elders were giving uh, during the conference. And so then we pulled out uh, these that were said uh, frequently mm -hmm. by various elders, these nine points. And then, uh, so we came up with them. Um, um, we looked at a lot of other codes that are out there, you know, uh, for spearfishing, and the state of Hawaii has put out codes, and other people have put out codes. And we wanted to keep ours simple. It's not like uh, some fishing groups have a commitment uh, code. We didn't want ours to be a commitment thing that people had to sign. It's, it's just something uh, educational, you know, to go out there. And so we held a fishers forum after that because we did want to run it by the community. Uh, so in 2011, we had it done at the Waikiki Aquarium with hundreds of people. We brought in uh, different speakers. We showed uh, various different codes that are in existence, mm -hmm. uh, including that United Nations code that I talked about uh, earlier, which is very lengthy. And, uh, and then we just got their feedback on it. And... Uh, also got feedback from a lot of the uh, agencies and, uh, and, and fishing groups and various people, and, and everyone seemed to be happy with these, uh, these nine points. Hmm. Um, so, curious question, what did we do before these practices and codes went into place, like, uh, decades before? Uh, how did, were, were there any issues, and how, how did people govern themselves? I, I think that there were always codes of conduct in place. We may not have written them down or even paid attention to them. It's just the common way that you you would behave, you know, at that time, uh, in the context of the time, in the context of the regulations that were created, that common way that you would behave there. And, you know, a code of conduct is really a, a voluntary compliance, yeah? You see the code of conduct, wow, if it makes sense to you, then we ask you to comply with it. If you take issue with them, then we can discuss that issue, yeah. What are the challenges of having everybody adapt and uh, accept the, this code of conduct? Well, one of the uh, issues is uh, for people who live in Hawaii and are raised in Hawaii and were born here, uh, they assimilate the code, you know, they, as they're growing up. But for newcomers who come, uh, like uh, new immigrant groups that mm -hmm. have come into Hawaii or maybe even the military who come in, they might not know, you know, how we behave in Hawaii, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, those are some of the issues. Um, with trying to get the code more well known and why we are translated in in uh, various languages. Mm, okay, uh, um, in general, how long does it take to? I don't know if you have a, f if you could put your finger on this. How long does it take for a new coming immigrant group to assimilate themselves with regard to the fishing industry? Is it? I mean, can you put a finger on that? Uh, that you know that that's that's a that's a really hard uh, question. I think that. When we have other Pacific Islanders come to Hawaii, they come from another culture that has its own code of conduct, has its own regulations. Mm. And they come here and maybe they have the idea that, whoa, there are no rules here. Mm. 
you know, and begin to cut and conduct themselves without those community um, pressures on them to conduct themselves in a certain way. Mm. And it's kind of a good good shield for them too, right? Oh, I, I, I didn't don't speak know. Like, yeah, I didn't know. And, and I think that um, in my experience is if you just talk to them and say, you know, this is how we do it here. And, and uh, in one community I saw on the Big Island where the community was complaining about the way certain Micronesian groups were fishing, when a, per- when a person of that Micronesian group came to them to a community meeting and explained himself, they welcomed him in and, and said, okay, this is how we do it here. Mm. You know, and then why don't you come down Sunday, we're going to have a gathering. And so I think there's, a, there's, a, there's an opportunity for cross-cultural uh, kind of relations to occur. Mm. And then there's also that need, right, to mm. have that code of conduct so that they know that they can, they, can, um, they can go someplace, they can get a code of conduct in their language, um, they can learn a little bit about this new place that they've moved to and maybe become a better citizen here, yeah. Mm, nice. Uh, so that leads into the question, how do new people, how does anybody learn about the codes? Uh, how, are they displayed? What's the outreach look like, Sylvia? Okay, so, well, we have had, uh, and there are signs down on some harbors in Molokai on Oahu uh, that we've put up uh with the Depo- Department of uh, Land and Natural Resources Division of Boating and Ocean Re- Recreation. They partnered with us on that, as well as some of the local Ahamokus have, who have uh, agreed to help m- make sure the signs are maintained. Um, the lifeguards have sh- expressed an interest in them, and so we might have signs uh, near their stations. In the, and then also uh, we've had uh, fishing and boating clubs express an interest, Hawaiian civic clubs. I, I went to some neighborhood boards and talked about this, and the canoe clubs. Uh, a lot of people have uh, really expressed an interest in them. So we have signs and harbors. Uh, we have posters that are both waterproof and not waterproof. We've distributed them to uh, Hawaiian charter and immersion schools. Uh, we also have public service announcements that have been uh, playing on TV stations, and we're going to be playing them on more radio and TV stations here coming up because we've tr- now translated them in other languages, as I, uh, as I mentioned. So uh, they can also go to our council website at wpcouncil.org and download anything. Uh, we're going to be making some postcards that we're putting in some conference bags for various conferences that will be held. So, uh, yeah, t- uh, teachers, uh, fishing uh, clubs, or anybody uh, is interested in getting copies, they could go to our website or call us or email us. Yeah, that's www.wpcouncil.org. This is a radio station, and we know that communication costs money. Uh, where does the funding for all this? I, I bet uh, you're challenged with not enough funds to get the word out. Would that be a fair statement? Um, yeah, I have a certain amount of budget for outreach each year, and uh, some of that had it, when we began this. Actually, we began this campaign back in 2010. We uh, had a grant with the Coral Reef uh, program with mm-hmm. NOAA that we used. Uh, we're using some other grant funds that we have on sustainable fisheries. Uh, but we feel like this is important, and so we are doing it. Mm-hmm. Also, the public service announcements, we're trying to get you know mm-hmm. uh, stations to play that for free. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, so. It's mean, always a challenge, can. though. I'm yes, a, it is. Getting, a getting the word out. Uh, we know that. Uh, so what other campaigns or projects is the Fishery Council working on? Well, we have a quarterly newsletter, so uh, people can subscribe to receive that by electronic um, files, or they can uh, get hard copies if they go to our website and sign up for it. Uh, we're also looking at putting a video out for grade school students on how our fish are caught and end up on your plate because it seems like uh, you know a lot of uh, people who are used to buying food at the stores don't understand the whole process of where the, your fish comes from and mm-hmm. what where it goes through to get onto your plate um, uh, we're also we've been uh, supporting traditional lunar calendars since 2007 and we're supporting a lunar conference that's coming up here at the University of Hawaii uh, this year uh, we're helping communities establish uh, fishery management plans. Uh, we're looking at the minimum size of ahi uh, it, that's being caught around Hawaii. 
and uh, also we're uh, updating our fishery ecosystem plans and annual reports to include more of the ecosystem-based management rather than just species-based management. How can people get involved uh, and learn more and w what more is there to learn? Yeah, so again, if they can go to our website, and from there they can uh, subscribe to our Facebook or Twitter account. We also have a YouTube and a Vimeo channels. We have uh, council meetings three times a year and a Fishers Forum that goes along with that in the evening time. Mm -hmm. Where do you meet? Well, we've been meeting at Pier 38, uh, but we've met in other places. We've met down at uh, Waikiki Aquarium. I mean, for the Fishers Forum I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. or. Uh, Right down here at the uh, at the end of the street uh, here. Laniakea. Yeah, at Laniakea YWCA, YWCA is where yeah. we've right. we've held our council meetings there recently. Alamoana Hotel, we've held them, but we make a lot of announcements on it. Uh, mm -hmm. So, if uh, but if they subscribe to our newsletter or, or to our any of our Facebook or Twitter accounts, they'll get notices of that. Right. But and we also mail them notices. Um, we also run things on. Uh, uh, Hawaii Goes Fishing, Let's Go Fishing. We help support uh, uh, radio stations that cover fishing talk shows. Uh, so there's a lot of ways, yeah. and we really want people to get involved because it's a bottom-up process. Yeah. We want their advice on uh, how their fishery should be managed sustainably so that they can have fresh fish forever. And if you visit our website, you can always get our calendar of meetings that are going on. There you go. Yeah. All right. Cool. And the website, one more time? It is www.wpcouncil.org. Thank you. We've been talking to Sylvia Spaulding, the Media and Education Specialist for the Western Pacific Regional Fishery Management Council, and Charles Kaai, the Indigenous Program Coordinator for the Fishery.